So much technology. So little time. All right, so in this video, I'm going to compare two career paths, someone in the medical field and someone in the technology field. So like the medical field would be like a physician, doctor, dentist, something like that. And maybe technology field would be like a software engineer or something like that. And see if technology is a, is a good path. Let's see. All right, so you might be asking, why am I qualified to compare these two technology fields? I mean, it's kind of almost impossible to be both like a software engineer and a physician at the same time. Like, just imagine that. A coding doctor. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. But anyways, I'm qualified to, I guess, compare these two fields. Because while I do work in software engineering currently, uh, you might say, like, I, I don't know much about the medical field. And you, you might be somewhat right there. I mean, I don't know all the ins and outs. But I do have a, bu a bunch of friends that do work in the medical field or are, I guess, studying to be in the medical field, like physicians, doctors, and something like that. All right, so first, let's gonna look at some of the salaries of these potential fields other than technology. So for example, a dentist, the career growth for dentistry in 2014 was 18%, with a median income of $151,000. And that median income is found from 2018. And let's compare that to a doctor with a 14% uh, I guess, career growth in 2014, and then a median income of $194,000 in 2018. So these might sound like high numbers compared to the next one, which is the software engineer, which would be 17% career growth with um, a median growth or median income of $103,000 in 2018. So just with this information alone, you might think to yourself, why might I take the lower salary if I can take the higher salary when the career growth doesn't seem to be too impactful on my future? So it's kind of a no brainer there. But is so you can't look at salary alone when looking to a career. You have to look at some other factors as well. So some of the, some extra factors that you want to look into other than salary when getting a job would be something like work life balance. So how does your work life compare to your life at home? You might want to look at how much schooling is required, if it requires 15 years of schooling or negative one years of schooling. Like you don't even have to go to school. <laughs> that would be nice. Uh, ease of getting a new job. So if you suddenly get fired for or let go because the company is downsizing, you, you want to see you want to get a new job, so you want to see how easy it is to do that. You will also want to look at the overall enjoyment of the field. This is probably one of the most important ones because if you don't enjoy the job, what are you doing it for? So yeah, if you don't enjoy your job, just quit your job, find a new one. But of course you want to find a new job before you quit the job because you want to have one lined up before you leave. This seems kind of obvious because you want to have, or at least have like enough in, uh, money saved up before you, so you can get, lose this source of income so you can continue like living. <laughs> That's important. So before I started working full time, I never really heard the term work-life balance be thrown around. And it's I think it's because when you work like part-time, it doesn't really matter. Your work-life balance, you, you have plenty of time for other things. But that's, that changes when you work over 40 hours a week. They start to combine into one thing. So in technology, you generally have a better work-life balance than in medical fields. And I'm going to tell you why. But I'm going to start off with reasons why you might not. So in technology fields, you generally have crunch periods. And what these are is they're periods where you have to work on something for like to get it done pretty quickly. And you don't have this kind of thing in the medical field. I mean, I guess you do have patients that you have to work on to get quickly. But this is more in like the period of like weeks or days or something you need to have to work on like a project or something for like a short amount of time but you have to spend a lot of time on it during that short amount of time so another way to think of these crunch periods is when like a, your boss or your product owner says you have to finish something by a certain deadline and if it's not done by the deadline then it's gonna be there's gonna be consequences so that's why you have to get it done so the final product or the version that you're working on has to be done by that time so this means that there are periods in the technology field where there's little to no work-life balance during these crunch periods. And then there's other times where there's 
probably a reasonable life balance where it's reasonable and not that bad. All right, now let's look at the medical field. So if you're like a physician and you work maybe on with operating tables and stuff like that, you might see some people die and that could affect your work-life balance if you're not used to it, especially maybe your first couple times or maybe you it might always have an impact on you because when you go home, you say, maybe to your significant other, oh, I saw someone die today and that might might have a negative effect on your life. Also, generally, uh, I guess doctors and people in hospitals are sick more often and this is because the people that goes to these hospitals are, I guess, sick, higher, have a higher chance of being sick than, uh, I guess, when you're just working in an office or remotely as a software engineer. So I guess if you're remotely, you have a, a pretty good work-life balance because you work and live, I guess, in the same place. Well, that really depends on, I guess, the job as well. So it's not unheard of for doctors to have 18 hour shifts, like two to three times a week. And these periods, you won't have much time to spend with your family if, if you have one. And it might, it might drain your work-life balance. So that's why I would say the technology field isn't, doesn't have that bad of a work-life balance compared to the technology field. And you're always, you're always moving when you're, uh, um, that's actually probably better when you're always moving when you're in the medical field, but because you always have to you know, get up and do something. Well, oftentimes technology, you're oftentimes sitting down and in one place. So the enjoyment factor of these career paths is an interesting, I guess, aspect of your decision to go through either of these career paths. And it's completely dependent on the individual person. If you like technology and coding, go for the technology path. I mean, it's, it's that simple. If you like, um, helping people and medicine and stuff like that, go for that path. It's, I mean, it, I think it's pretty simple that way. So some people might like building blocks when they're growing up. And if, if they like that, if you like that, then go for technology because you're often, oftentimes building stuff. You don't get to build that much, I have found or I've heard when you're in the medical field. And if you're like helping people when you, you were growing up, then you might decide to go on the medical path to help other people and help them get better. So the other factor when looking at a career path is schooling, of course. And if you're required to go to school for 10 years for a job, you might ask yourself, what could I do with all that time with less schooling or no schooling at all? So you might have heard nowadays that you don't need to go to school to be in the technology field sometimes. You can go to boot camps and sometimes that'll be quite all right to find a, a sufficient job. Might not be all quite all right maybe for some bigger companies, but to find a a well-paying job you don't necessarily need to go to school however the average I guess IT or software work engineer does require a bachelor bachelor's degree at, like at minimum usually and sure you might say that some jobs might require a PhD with like AI and machine learning um, but you might find that the salary doesn't increase like exponentially for the amount of years so you might say those number of years might not be worth it for those kind of degrees and Oftentimes, it's just a bachelor's is only required. So you might think, hey, to be a physician, you need to, you have to go to school for a lot more years. And what would be the opportunity cost of going to school for those extra number of years? So let's, let's look into that. So to be a physician, you need to go through four years of undergraduate and then four years of medical school. And then oftentimes three to seven years of that additional res residency before you can actually get paid the 194k average. So that's about 11 to 15 years on average. So the average cost of medical school, we're, we're just gonna ignore the undergraduate since they might average out at this point between getting a bachelor, because I guess both fields might require a bachelor, even though you might ne not necessarily need one for software engineering. So the average cost of medical school is going to be $34,000, let's say. So I'm mean, just, we're looking at average. Of course it could be higher if you go to like a more expensive uh, place, college. So over the four years, you're expected to take out loans. I mean, we're, I guess you, your parents could pay for it, but if, if you don't have that kind of money, which is a lot, 34K a year, just for um, this kind of expense. So that's gonna be $140,000 in loans on average. And that's not even mentioning the undergraduate loans, which you might not have because they're usually less or undergraduate is usually cheaper than 
medical school. However, it is not unheard of for people to have taken out $500,000 in student loans over the whole course of becoming a physician or a doctor or something like that. So after you're done with medical school, you might say, oh, now you can uh, become a physician. Not so fast. You have to go through residency. Well, like I said, it was three to seven years. And you might be expected to earn a little bit of money during this period. Not not that much. Not not like a full physician salary. So maybe 40K to 50K a year. And you probably won't be able to pay off the loans at this point. You might be able to just make the minimum payments on them with 40K to 50K. And at that point, they're probably just racking up interest. So you're losing money off of that as well. So those are some of the opportunity costs of um, going through all this extra schooling and the costs of paying the loans off. So all of this is not even mentioning that you might fail out of medical school. And although it is very rare compared to undergraduate, it's like 96% uh, like attrition rate. So 4% chance of failing. I mean, it's still there. And if you fail out like in your final year, that, that would really suck, unfortunately. But you would still have to pay off the loans. Those, those still have to be there. And you might even get into residency and decide, I don't want to do this. And it, it happens to some people. Or you might not do residency right or something like that and you might finish medical school and you might have to do go down a different career path. So on my path to getting uh, my bachelor's degree in physics, I only took out about $10,000 in loans and that's mainly because I was working while I was in school, kind of like part-time jobs, I was a resident assistant and whatnot. Um, so I worked most of my undergrad and if I didn't have enough money to pay for the I guess, rent to the apartment or the, or rent to the dorms. My scholar.